good to think of the Buddha and the courage that he brought to his practice. It may stir up some courage in ours. And there's no guarantee that he was going to gain awakening when he left his home. He was going against all the conventions of his time. He had just had a son, and he was expected to stay and at the very least see the son up to adulthood. But he left. He was expected to carry on the family line, but he left. You can imagine all the people telling him if he had actually brought up the prospect of leaving and trying to find a deathless happiness, they would all say, oh, it's impossible. Nobody's been able to do it. What makes you think you can? He'd been brought up in a very refined, very lavish household. They were pretty sure that he didn't have what it would take, or even if it was possible. I mean, the, India had many stories of hermits who had gone out and tried to gain awakening and failed one way or another. Yet the Buddha decided that whether people agreed with what he did or not didn't matter. What did matter was that he devoted his life to something really worthwhile. If he had devoted his life to power, well, power goes. If he devoted his life to his sensual pleasures, they go as well. even devoting himself to his family. We all know what happens to families. They break apart. The people you raised may die before you do, and they may die after, but everybody's going to die at some point. You wonder what's going to be left. We have that book in our library called The Past from Above. and You see all these amazing buildings, amazing in the sense that they, they must have forced a lot of labor to erect these things way in the past. Now what's left? It's just some stones in the desert. So the Buddha wanted to find something that was really worthwhile, something that was not subject to aging, illness, or death. That's a very courageous goal, a very courageous idea even, just to think about it. Of course, he wasn't facing just the opposition of the people outside him, as he told Mara when Mara came to tempt him to stop his practice. He realized that Mara's armies were not forces outside. It was all these defilements in his own heart. It's not like the Buddha was totally pure from the beginning of his practice. He had greed, aversion, and delusion as well. He had impatience. This practice had its ups and downs. But he didn't let the downs get him down. Even after six years of austerities, when he had pushed the limits as to what a human being can do in, in terms of denying himself any kind of pleasure at all. At that point, it looked pretty hopeless. He'd seen that sensual pleasures didn't offer anything of lasting value. Now it turned out that self-affliction, which seemed to be the only other alternative, didn't offer anything either. And some people might have given up there. At the very least, they might have said, well, I've gone to the ultimate in self-affliction. I'll just keep this up. It'd be a shame to throw away what I've already invested so much time in. But he realized it wasn't working. There had to be another way. And so he kept looking for another way. And then they finally came across the middle path. So notice here that courage doesn't necessarily mean stubbornness. It means facing down difficulties and not letting yourself get way later, not letting yourself get discouraged by the difficulties. And they would have been up with pain. It took a lot of courage to deal with all that pain. 
he was able to stir up within himself the conviction that even though there's pain in the practice, you can't let that set you aside. The same goes for mental pain, the, the aversion, the, the difficulties, the emotional difficulties that we face in the practice, especially when you find yourself running up against some pretty strong defilements. And they seem just totally stubborn, unwilling to give way. And they seem to have taken up part of your own mind. It's part of your own mind that's saying, nope, 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 I don't want this. That's when you have to have the courage to let that go. Say, no, I cannot identify with that, even though it's been part of you for who knows how long. The greed, the aversion, the illusion, the lust, the whatever. Just got to say, no, I cannot identify with that any longer. Got to drop it. It's like that man who had to saw off his arm because it was trapped in a, under a boulder. He realized that the only way he was going to survive was to sacrifice the arm. There are sacrifices we have to make in the practice. This is where a lot of the courage comes in. We have to sacrifice our comfort, sacrifice a lot of our ideas, things that we've held dear to, we've held dear to ourselves for so long, that we've identified with so, for so long. There comes a point where you have to say, you have to make a choice. And part of us wants to hold back, saying, can I have both? And the courage lies in learning to say, no, that's an either-or proposition here. And have you had enough of wandering around under the influence of your greed, aversion, and delusion? Or would you like some more? One of the big problems in the practice is being unwilling to admit that there are choices that we have to make like that. We always want to muddle through with a both end. We want things to be a certain way. And even though they're not going to be that way, we keep pushing and pushing and pushing. That's not courage, that's stubbornness, and it's important to know the difference between the two. The courage comes in realizing You've met up with an either-or, and you've got to choose. And for once, why don't you choose the skillful side? And the way to give energy to that courage is to remind yourself that there, these are trade-offs. That even though some of the choices we have to make may be hard, may require putting ourselves out on a limb, still we do have the example of the Buddha. They showed that he benefited from sacrificing those things. It wasn't like he was born ready to make sacrifices, as he himself once said, when he realized that he was going to have to give up his sensual passions in order to get the mind into concentration. His heart didn't leap up at the idea. But still, when he realized that there were advantages to be had from giving up those passions, he put them aside. So we have his example. He didn't have that example. He was feeling his way with no guarantees. And here we have, what, 2,500 years of examples of people who have gained awakening. Of course, for us, the only proof will be what was the proof for them, that you have to find it within. But there are examples that su suggest that this is possible. There are advantages to letting go of the things that we hold to very tightly. So we have this opportunity now. We don't know how much longer we're going to have it. As the Buddha himself admitted, the, the life of his dharma was going to be limited. There'll be times, there will come a time when people have forgotten it. And the name Buddha will just be a memory. In the parts of the world now where you can't even learn about Buddhism, it's forbidden by other religions that have moved in. It's interesting how the, the Buddha image is what sort of precedes Buddhism and then is its last evidence of having been someplace. It turns out when Buddhism first went into China, it was known as the religion of images. 
that's what people thought of. It was the, the Buddha image. And you wanted to have a Buddha image in your house. It was nice. Either they felt it had magical properties or just very peaceful to look at. And then there was a period in Chinese history where everything was forgotten, everything was blotted out. All they had were the images in the, in the hills. Same in other countries. Here it's pretty similar. It's people who don't think of themselves as Buddhist might still like to have a Buddha image around the house someplace because it's peaceful. And maybe someday that's all that's going to be left of Buddhism here in the, in the West. A few leftover Buddha images. Suggesting that there is some possibility of peace, but and who knows what people are going to read into that smile, read into those closed eyes. Right now we have a lot of information. And we have a lot of examples as well. It's not just words. There are examples of the Great Ajans, the men and women who have gained awakening. And in every case they said there were difficulties, but ultimately they, they bit the bullet. And they had to choose between just giving up or sitting through pain, say. Giving up the prospect of some physical pleasures. Giving up the prospect of certain relationships. When they put their lives on the line. That's the word of John. <coughs> Excuse me, that's the phrase that a John Fuang used one time. He said that the people went out into the forest and they put their lives on the line. And that's how they found the drama. So when you meet up with difficulties, remind yourself of that. And it's not that they were special, amazing human beings made out of titanium who didn't feel pain. They felt pain. Their minds were conflicted, just like yours. But there came a point when they had to make the choice. They realized they had to make the choice, and they made it. So try to show some courage in your practice. And you find that you'll be repaid many times over. <laughs>